okay welcome back you there was a small technical error so let us start our class again okay so coming to next topic is nerve supply of your lateral wall of nose okay nerve supply of lateral wall of nose just you already know no need to buy heart again so you already know superiorly there will be olfactory nerves okay your nose is concerned with the function of the smell right so olfactory nerves will be lying above so the superior part of the nasal cavity and the you are the superior part of the nasal cavity and the roof of your nose will be lined by all the olfactory nerve fibers so number one roof of the nose and the superior part will be covered by olfactory nerve fibers right this is cranial nerve number one right and uh, see here the nerves this is anterior this entire thing is ethmoidal area right so anteriorly you can see here one nerve entering this is your anterior ethmoidal nerve okay anterior ethmoidal nerve in the same way you can see here a posterior ethmoidal nerve also okay and also in the same way you can see here entering in this part vestibular part is infraorbital nerve okay infraorbital nerve okay you i already studied in the infraorbital groove this infraorbital nerve and infraorbital artery infraorbital vein will be running on either sides and uh, that will be supplying your vestibular area infraorbital nerve so when removing haller cell you should be careful not to damage this nerve right and also the sphenopalatine here exactly posterior to the middle turbinate inferior turbinate middle turbinate and superior turbinate will be lying like this see the middle turbinate posterior to the middle turbinate you have one opening that opening is called as sphenopalatine foramen what is the significance of sphenopalatine foramen the do you know what is this jna juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma the origin of the jna is supposed to be from the sphenopalatine foramen so the mucosa lying over this foramen is supposed to give rise to jna right okay where exactly is this opening of sphenopalatine foramen lies the sphenopalatine foramen lies posterior to the posterior end of your middle turbinate okay the posterior end of your middle turbinate you will be seeing an opening that is called as sphenopalatine foramen likewise you also see an opening at the posterior end of the inferior turbinate what is that opening anyone so this opening is eustachian tube opening very famous right in the year class we have studied okay right so another nerve okay number three and another nerve that enters through the sphenopalatine foramen is the sphenopalatine branches okay so the posterior part of the nasal cavity is supplied by this sphenopalatine nerve okay right so remember the nerve supply olfactory from above and uh, anterior ethmoidal posterior ethmoidal and sphenopalatine and infraorbital done so no need to by heart the nerve supply just remember the structures present surrounding the naming will be done accordingly okay and now coming to the blood supply almost in a similar way the blood supply will be there so this is blood supply of the lateral wall of the nose you can see anterior ethmoidal posterior ethmoidal right done clear this is clear and uh, so coming to the anterior ethmoidal and posterior ethmoidal so the these are the branches of your ophthalmic artery and your ophthalmic artery is a branch of internal carotid artery remember this point okay the anterior ethmoidal and posterior ethmoidal are branches of the ophthalmic branch of the internal carotid artery so this part this upper part of the nasal cavity is supplied by internal carotid artery branches indirectly okay and whereas the remaining entire remaining so anterior and posterior parts are all supplied by your external carotid artery branches in the front if you see this part is supplied by facial artery branch facial branch is a branch of external carotid artery facial branch is a branch facial artery is a branch of external carotid artery and also you can see here two arteries coming from posteriorly these two are branches of maxillary artery see maxillary artery is again a branch of external carotid artery so the external carotid will give rise to eight branches total 
of which facial and maxillary are one of them okay the maxillary will again get divided into your sphenopalatine and greater palatine again you can see here sphenopalatine artery and here you this artery is named as greater palatine artery right so these are the main blood supply of your lateral wall of the nose in the same way as nerves you can see anterior ethmoidal artery posterior ethmoidal artery branches of ophthalmic which is a branch of the internal carotid so anteriorly you can see the other entire other uh, areas are supplied by external carotid artery branches of which mainly maxillary and facial branches will supply this lateral nasal wall and from the maxillary you have a sphenopalatine artery and a greater palatine artery and from the facial artery anterior inferior part of the the vestibular area all those anterior part of the lateral nasal cavity is supplied right so this is all about the blood supply right coming to the next part that is your septum okay septum right so septum very easy to remember not much difficult septum on the whole septum has got three parts okay of which one is septum proper we call it as and the second one is membranous septum and the third one is bony septum bony septum occupies a larger part okay or uh, columellar septum so not bony septum columellar septum okay so septum proper occupies the bony part septum proper membranous septum anteriorly and columellar septum still anteriorly if we see the bones forming the <coughs> septum you can see this one is a frontal bone okay you can see the frontal sinus lying over here so one is your frontal the majority bulk part of the septum is formed by your ethmoid okay this is your ethmoid what exactly is this part perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and you can see over here this entire thing is cartilage quadrangular in shape so this is a quadrangular cartilage okay okay and uh, the other bones you can see the greenish bone the majority of the posterior superior inferior part of the uh, this one septum is formed by your favorite vomer which is hard part of the septum vomer and here you can see a part of the <coughs> sphenoid is coming and forming the septum part that is your rostrum of the sphenoid and uh, you can see anteriorly the maxillary crust maxillary crust is forming over here and here you can see the palatine crest okay the palatine bone is forming this crest over here so these are the various bones that take part in the formation of the septum okay too difficult to remember but once you practice the diagram it will be easy okay the anteriorly cartilage will be there that is quadrangular cartilage and once you go superiorly you will have the ethmoid perpendicular plate from above will be forming the septum a thin papery plate like structure will be coming up that is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and as you go back vomer will be there if you go up rostrum will be there and down at the floor of the septum you will be having anteriorly maxillary crest and posteriorly palatine crest so very easy to remember first of all whenever you enter into the septum during septoplasty you will come across the cartilaginous septum if you go back straighter above you will be having your perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and below you will be having vomer if you still stay go up above you will be landing in the sphenoid anterior face of the sphenoid so that part which is forming the part of the septum of the sphenoid uh, that is called as rostrum of the sphenoid very hard structure see due to in a, this uh, posterior septectomy we remove this rostrum and part of the vomer and perpendicular plate near the sphenoids okay in this case see here above the sphenoid lying will be your pituitary gland okay so skull based surgery is where pituitary tumor removal are involved here this part entire posterior septectomy is done and septum a sphenoid wall is removed and this is opened and you enter into the uh, cerebral cavity to the, to remove the pituitary tumors in this way this is the approach used for okay intracerebral surgeries okay to remove the pituitary tumors okay so so coming to our part so cartilage initially and posteriorly above you will be having ethmoid perpendicular plate below you will be having vomer and still posteriorly rostrum and the floor you will be having your maxillary crest and palatine crest right so these are the parts of the bony septum okay septum proper right and coming to the next part 
what exactly is this membranous septum you can see even if you hold your uh, midline the septum the filtrum by above the filtrum part if you hold your columella and if you press uh, you will feel a cartilage touching your to your fingers like this if you you can feel the cartilage touching and in front of the cartilage there is a cartilage defect area there is no cartilage no bone only both layers of mucosa will be present so those that area is called as membranous septum why it is membranous septum is there is no bone no cartilage so that is membranous septum okay so only two mucosal membranes will be attaching over here right and the other one is columellar septum this columellar septum is formed by your the lower we already studied there are two lateral alar cartilages those two alar cartilages the medial wings will be holding inward in the midline and those two will be forming the columellar septum so columellar septum is a cartilaginous structure formed by lower lateral cartilages or alar cartilages okay alar cartilages the medial wings of the alar cartilages will form this columellar septum okay fine and coming to the next structure that is your uh, septal trauma next topic is septal trauma what exactly in septal trauma what kind of fractures the most common cause of septal trauma is road traffic accident uh, or other in other in types of injuries include sports injuries and interpersonal altercations okay under alcohol influence all those things will be there and if the blow is from the front then there will be the fracture will be is like a jarge away type of fracture okay if the blow is from the front uh, there will be jarge away so this is a jarge away type of fracture if the blow is from the front like this okay and if the blow is from the above the fracture line runs vertically this we call it as a chevalet and if the fracture blow is from the side there will be a c-shaped deformity so three types of fractures you can see in septum jarjavi chevalet and c-type c-type if you uh, if you <coughs> give a blow from the sideways from the front on the front will be jarjavi and from below will be chevalet okay and here you can see the septal fracture you can see the septal fracture over here okay if you can notice clearly there is a septal fracture over here and due to the septal fracture there is a formation of the hematoma over here okay so <coughs> we will come across to uh, we will come across the septal hematoma also remember what is jarjave so jarjave will be from the front on collision or front on uh, blow and the, from the below blow will be chevalet and from the sides will be c shaped deformation will be there okay so the treatment for these septal fractures is okay if first of all if there is epistaxis there is incontrollable bleed first go for anterior nasal packing and if still anterior nasal packing is not adequate then you have to go for posterior nasal packing either with foles or anything okay so posterior nasal packing can be done and if still not uh, bleeding is not controlled uh, then you may have to go for a cauterization of the bleeding points if still not controlled then you have to go for external carotid artery ligation or uh, you can go for sphenopalatine artery ligation if still it is not stopping you have to go for external carotid artery ligation right so this is about your uh, epistaxis if there is any epistaxis and if there is a septal fracture okay if there is septal fracture with the help of ash forceps with the help of ash forceps you can reduce the septum okay closer reduction of the septum can be done by ash forceps and if there is nasal bone fracture nasal bone fractures can be reduced with valsham forceps okay this is valsham forceps okay so a septal reduction can be done by ash forceps and nasal bone fracture will be done by valsham forceps important do not interchange the forceps for these structures very important because for septum the there should be a mild gap in between when the two prongs of the forceps close there should be a mild gap to hold the septum properly and you have to hold the septum and you have to lift it up 
such that they will come back in this place apply a splint and that will be done okay so in case in cases of traumas where there is fracture sometimes you will be seeing edema okay if there is edema over there so you have to wait till the edema subsides okay wait till the edema subsides and then you go for surgical closure reduction if there is a comminuted fracture multiple pieces of nasal bones are there you may have to go for a open rhinoplasty procedure right coming to the next structure that is septal deviation which is most common cause okay the most common cause of septal deviation is trauma during birth okay various types of septal deviation will be present anterior c shaped s shaped spur type and uh, uh, bulky uh, <coughs> type okay so the spur nasal spurs are responsible for bleeding in most of the cases you have to surgically operate and remove the spur the causes other causes <coughs> for uh, uh, septal deviation will be adenoid hypertrophy in cases of adenoid hypertrophy what happens you know gothic palate what happens the patient will be breathing through the mouth instead of the nose because at the back of the nose uh, if you take the adenoid okay if you take your nose like this okay right and this is your uh, lips and chin okay like this you have your tongue over here right okay and this is your throat okay right so if you take adenoid will be lying over here okay here you will be the soft palate uvula will be there so adenoid will be enlarged adenoid will become like this so it impedes the air flow it obstructs the air flow through this passage and what happens patient will open their mouth child will open the mouth and will breathe through the mouth okay so there will be mouth breathing complaint will be there by the adenoid hypertrophy patient and uh, so when, once they start uh, breathing through the mouth for prolonged periods of time due to the air uh, passage continuously the palate which lies like this okay will become like a gothic light so what happens the adenoid will uh, the sorry the palate will get pushed up curved up uh, so above the palate is lying your septum so that septum gets buckled to one side any one side and on that side there will be uh, this uh, deviation of the septum and nose block will be complete on one that one side so that is how you are adenoid hypertrophy can cause a septal deviation right sometimes the septal deviation may gets pressed on middle turbinate so and the anterior ethmoid fibers gets compressed and pain in forehead so some patients will be complaining of uh, pain over here in this region especially when there is cold okay so when there is cold temperature or when they uh, when they get exposed to cold temperatures okay more so what happens the mucosal uh, layers inside will swell the turbinates will sell swell in the cold temperatures so when they swell what happens already deviated septum may compress the swollen turbinates now and when the middle turbinate gets uh, pressed compressed uh, the ethmoidal nerve gets irritated and that causes some pain over in this region okay whichever side it is uh, touching pressing on that side the patient will complain of the pain and the pain will be increased during cold episodes so that is your called as anterior ethmoidal neuralgia or sladder's neuralgia okay surgically it can be operated right and coming to the cortel's test uh, see the cortel's test is nothing but just to check whether the nasal septum is causing enough the, uh, nose block or not whichever side the patient is complaining of the nose block pull the cheek on that side that will pull the lateral wall to a bit laterally okay the nasal valve area will get a bit widened uh, and patient will get instantaneous relief from the nasal obstruction once you leave it again it will be back so that indicates that there is a septal deviation inside and you may have to plan for a proper septoplasty that is cortel's test so cortel's test is done to know the existence of deviated nasal septum functional okay functional test for deviated nasal septum and the treatment for deviated nasal septum two surgeries are there in total submucous resection and septoplasty in submucous resection you will remove the deviated part okay and uh, you, <coughs> you will remove the deviated part you will open the mucosal layers on both sides and you will remove the deviated part again you will close the mucosal layers on both sides so and you will suture it up in the septoplasty the deviated part which is removed is again straightened and again place it back so that is your septoplasty the difference between submucous resection and septoplasty is very simple in submucous resection you just remove the deviated part in septoplasty this removed deviated part is straightened and kept again back in the septum okay so this is the difference between submucous resection and septoplasty 
coming to the septal hematoma septal hematoma is nothing but there is a collection due to trauma most of the time so there is a collection of blood between the cartilage and its covering perichondrium or periosteum because in the septum you will be having the interiorly lying cartilage and posterior lying bony part so on the bony part the covering will be periosteum and on the cartilaginous part it, the covering will be perichondrium anywhere there is a collection in between these two as the perichondrium is tightly attached to the underlying cartilage or the periosteum is tightly attached to the underlying osteum bone the any smallest collection inside will cause a severe pain likewise in your perichondritis also we have studied on the ear where in the perichondritis also the chondrite the cartilage and its surrounding perichondrium in between these two layers there is a collection as this is a very tightly attached structure slightest pressure on this layer will cause a severe pain okay here also the patient will be complaining of the pain and uh, the patient will be having a frontal referred headache, a frontal headache will be there and uh, immediate, if you don't operate immediately, what happens, the hematoma due to its increased pressure on the cartilage, the cartilage and bone may get dissolved due to the pressure on it and uh, because that pressure impedes the blood supply, necrosis can happen and the nasal shape can get changed, okay. So that's why, so you have to immediately operate on a septal, just give a nick in anteriorly and all that uh, do all the drainage and then relieve the pressure that's it it will be fine okay and uh, the complications of septal hematoma if you are not treating immediately then there may be sometimes the necrosis will not occur the septal abscess if any bacterial infection sets in there forms a abscess abscess can form and also sometimes the thickening of the septum can occur so abscess is nothing but secondary bacterial infection of the septal hematoma simple okay so first trauma first uh, hematoma and then abscess okay and then <coughs> if still abscess stage also not treated if it resolves on its own with antibiotics and the thickened part of the septum will lie thickening of the nasal septum can be left like that okay so complication of a septal hematoma is a septal abscess that is due to the secondary bacterial infection of hematoma so patient again will be having as there is a bulge of the septum on either side obstructing both the nasal cavities nasal obstruction uh, past history of trauma will be there headache, headache, fever, due to bacterial infection, fever will be there. So, anterior rhinoscopy, you can see on either side, a form swelling on either side of the septum. Because the either side, because the swelling will be in the midline, occurring from midline on either side. So, on either sides of the septum, you can see the swelling in the septum. Okay, again, treatment is again incision and drainage. Okay, you have to excise a small piece of mucosa and leave it open so that the uh, new forming pus will get completely drained away. Okay, that is about septal abscess and septal perforation. So, why the septal perforation? What is the septal perforation means? Communication of one nasal cavity to other nasal cavity through the septum. So, that occurs through the septal perforation. In submucous resection surgeries, during while doing your submucous resection surgery of deviated nasal septum, what happens? If you are not closing the flaps properly, if your flap tear occurs, tear of the uh, mucosal flap occurs on any one side, and other side gets dried up continuously and that side also gets necrosed in that area a septal perforation can be formed so this septal perforation is a complication of submucous resection the causes other non uh, instead of iatrogenic some other causes will be there those are syphilis okay in case of syphilis bony septum is perforated because syphilis organism mostly invades bones uh, and in case of vaginal granulomatosis both bony and cartilaginous parts are destroyed. Okay, in other, you know, some people will be, the cocaine addicts will be constantly rubbing the cocaine to the nasal mucosa. Okay, that cocaine can cause abrasion of the mucosa over there on both sides and the mucosa can get completely dried up and okay, perforation can form through and through. Okay, so cocaine addicts also can form a septal perforation. Also, sometimes the prolonged decongestant artrovin, the most famous artrovin, nasal drops, all patients will be buying over the counter whenever they feel nose blood they will be putting it off okay so this continuous usage of nasal decongestion is supposed to cause a lot of problems in the nasal cavity not only septal perforations they will cause a country rhinitis medicamentosa that condition where everything looks normal but patient won't be able to sense the airflow okay so it will be constantly later on if there is a a prolonged persistent use of artrovin for years together then the patient will land in this condition even though every structure looks normal the patient won't be feeling the nose air entry in the nose 
so he will be always be complaining of nose block and uh, uh, so there is no proper treatment for this okay so be careful don't use otterville nasal drops repeatedly in case you are having a persistent nose block consult your nearest ENT and get it solved okay and the treatment for septal perforation is there are new uh, nowadays elastic buttons have come so a button like elastic buttons we are closing it off or mucosal flap reconstructions so one side pull the mucosa from above to below other side from below to above so that both sides mucosal layers will come and close each other so that's another way okay and that is mucosal flap reconstructions right coming to the next part and in case of septal perforations remember the whistling sound will be complained by the patient because whenever they take in air through that small hole the air will be passing and it will be making a sound whistling sounds will be complained some surgeons even say that if the whistling is the main complaint of the patient instead of nose block just make the small perforation into a larger one so what happens in case of larger perforation there won't be whistling sounds okay so that is being uh, 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 proposed by some people okay so coming to the blood supply of septum we have already completed this littles area the most important is littles area in epistaxis okay so in littles area which lies in the anterior inferior part of the septum okay in the anterior inferior part of the septum uh, this is formed by four arteries here superior labial artery which is a branch of the facial artery okay superior labial artery greater palatine sphenopalatine okay so the sphenopalatine runs and the greater palatine comes from here and the superior labial artery comes from here right and uh, your anterior ethmoidal artery comes from here so the four arteries will be converging in one area and they will be forming a little area so an extensive rich uh, uh, blood supply will be there in that area so most of the children will be brought to you clinically in complaint of nose bleeding but due to some uh, nasal infections or uh, itching inside the, the child will keep on uh, no speaking okay doing the no speaking so what happens his nail will uh, traumatize the little area where kieselbach's plexus is located rich vascular supply the slightest of the mucosal rupture there will be a epistaxis the continuous blood flow will be there of course you can just press the nasal uh, press the nose for a few minutes it will stop and uh, ask the patient to avoid the nose picking okay so most common site of anterior epistaxis is the little area that is your kissel wax plexus it is seen mostly in children and the most common cause in children is nose picking okay coming to the posterior epistaxis which is most commonly seen in adults which is seen in especially in hypertensive patient uncontrolled hypertensive people in hypertensive emergencies most of the patients will be complaining of epistaxis nasal blade so then woodruff's plexus is supposed to uh, uh, start this uh, the bleeding is supposed to occur from this woodruff's plexus which is located posteriorly however there is still some uh, controversy regarding the existence of this plexus whether this is exactly causing the epistaxis in case of hypertension or not but till now people believe that anteriorly the epistaxis is due to the little area kieselbach's plexus formed by your superior labial artery or facial branch and your sphenopalatine and greater palatine those are the branches of your maxillary which is a branch of external carotid and anterior ethmoidal artery which is a branch of ophthalmic that is a branch of internal carotid okay so and woodruff's plexus is a remember one more important point kieselbach's plexus is arterial plexus woodruff's plexus is venous plexus which is located posteriorly and most common site for posterior epistaxis in case of posterior epistaxis anterior nasal packing won't work you have to go for a posterior nasal packing okay and coming to the dangerous area of face okay they wear in this area the deep facial vein drains this area directly into the pterygoid plexus which again enter into the cavernous sinus causing cavernous sinus thrombosis coming to epistaxis is nothing but bleeding from the nose is epistaxis remember epistaxis is not a diagnosis epistaxis is just a medical terminology detect, uh, denoted for bleeding from nose okay nose bleeding so it's a medical term is epistaxis it is just a symptom it is not a diagnosis the causes of epistaxis can be trauma hemophilic disorders where the coagulation factor deficiencies with vitamin k deficiency cirrhosis liver abnormalities 
So vitamins, uh, the triglycerin factors 2, 7, 9, 10, where the liver produces these factors, uh, factors triglycerin factors are deficient. And one more hereditary condition, congenital condition, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia or Osler Weber Rendu disease, okay? Or we also call it Osler Weber Rendu disease, okay? So, first of all, epistaxis, you have to go for anterior nasal packing. And if it fails, then you have to go for posterior nasal packing. If it still fails, you have to go for ligation techniques. So, first of all, you will try to cauterize first. If still it is not uh, sufficient, then you may have to go for ligation. So, first you will go for sphenopalatine artery ligation. If still not stopping, you will go for uh, external carotid artery ligation. If still not stopping, you may have to suspect the bleeding from the internal carotid pathway so where ophthalmic arteries uh, ophthalmic branch uh, anterior ethmoidal and posterior ethmoidal so those may be causing bleeding you can ligate those arteries later on okay see first artery ligation in ligated in epistaxis is phenopalatine artery okay the sphenopalatine artery the procedure procedure name is called as tespal transnasal endoscopic sphenopalatine artery ligation so this procedure is called as tespal Transnasal endoscopic sphenopalatine artery ligation, TESPAL. So, the sphenopalatine artery is located at the sphenopalatine foramen. Where exactly is this sphenopalatine foramen is lying? This is lying at the posterior end of the middle turbinate. You give an incision in the mucosa, elevate the mucosa and go posteriorly behind the middle turbinate. You will come across the opening, foramen opening. There you can identify the sphenopalatine. At the level of the, the near the crista ethmoidalis, an elevation will be there on the ethmoidal bone. That is your crista ethmoidalis is a landmark for doing sphenopalatine artery ligation. If it fails, uh, then the sphenopalatine artery is a branch of your maxillary artery. Then go to its parent, maxillary artery. So this maxillary artery has to be identified in pterygopalatine fossa. Where exactly is this pterygopalatine fossa located? Behind the maxillary sinus, okay? So, if you take from the anterior to posterior, this is the septum on both sides of the nasal cavity. Okay, on either sides you will be having the maxillary sinuses and behind the maxillary sinuses, you will be having the pterygopalatine fossa. Here, sphenopalatine foramen will be connecting this pterygopalatine fossa and the nasal cavity. Okay, so through the sphenopalatine foramen, enter the uh, pterygopalatine fossa and uh, identify the maxillary and ligate it. If still not stopped, the parent of maxillary artery, that is external carotid artery, so just above the branching of the superior thyroid artery, so the identify the first branch of the external carotid artery, that is the superior thyroid artery, and uh, once the branching is given to the superior thyroid artery, then identify the external carotid and ligate it there. So if it still doesn't stop, then go for the anterior ethmoidal artery. Where to identify this anterior ethmoidal artery is, it lies 24 millimeters posterior to anterior lacrimal crest on the medial wall of the orbit. Okay. So, on the orbit, on the medial wall of the orbit, if you start from the lacrimal crest anteriorly, go 24 mm posteriorly, you can identify anterior ethmoidal artery. If you go 12 mm still posteriorly, you can identify posterior ethmoidal artery also. Okay. So, in case of bleeding polypus, where the small swellings are there on the nasal septum, bleeding polypus can be identified sometimes. So, you can do a chemical cauterization, apply silver nitrate on the polyp and it will get regressed. If not, then go to uh, take him to OT and uh, uh, cauterize the bleeding polypus. That will be enough, right? Trotter's method is used for initially whenever immediately when you are, uh, uh, if someone is immediately bleeding, uh, press the nose and stay for 5 minutes like that. Start breathing through the nose at that time. So, that is your Trotter's method, okay? So, coming to the next uh, Hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, as I already said, it's another name is Osler Weber Rendo disease. It is an autosomal dominant genetic condition. Everywhere in the mucosal layer, the telangiectasia will be happening because of the arteriovenous small formations, not only in the mucosa over the lips or nose or tongue or the oral cavity or nasal cavity, you can also see in the lungs, liver, and also in the liver, uh, the brain, also you can see the uh, this one, uh, arteriovenous malformations. The treatment is with a drug called as Bevacizumab. So, still it is under trial. And coming to the uh, lining of the internal nose, which is very important. 
the lining of the internal nose is and the above you know you already know everyone knows in the superior part of the nasal cavity olfactory it is the entire area is related to the olfaction olfactory fibers will be lying so that mucosa is olfactory mucosa consisting of olfactory fibers and if you come down the entire uh, other uh, region is uh, covered by respiratory mucosa as as you open your nose and see inside you will be seeing the pinkish layer that is nothing but your respiratory mucosa so, uh, what is exactly is this respiratory mucosa ciliated columnar pseudo stratified with the goblet cells why goblet cells are there means so there is there should be continuous mucus secretions inside the nasal cavity which these secretions are lined all over the if they all over the mucosal layer the watery layer will be there this will absorb all the dust particles or all the uh, unrequired contaminants in the air all this will be absorbed by this watery layer and the filtered air will be entering into your lungs so this is very important in the nose that the ciliated columnar pseudo stratified epithelium with the goblet cells should be present in order to filtrate the air one of the important functions of the nose not only just nose acts as a conduit for the passage of your air it filtrates it it humidifies the air whenever required it dehumidifies whenever required it changes the temperature of the air once the you see your inferior turbinate on the both sides are lying like this in the inferior turbinate middle turbinate and superior turbinate the blood will be flowing from back to from posterior to anterior and the air will be entering from anterior to posterior and uh, the air will be in constant touch with the mucosal surface of the turbinates so there the convection of the uh, heat flow occurs convection with the help of convection the temperature change shifts occurs uh, and your inhaled air will be adjusted to your body temperature and it will be sent to the lungs so temperature and humidity adjustments are very important in the inhaled air that is done by your nose especially turbinates and the uh, filtration that is the watery layer that is the the goblet cell secretion that uh, the, the watery layer will be lying all over lining all over your entire nasal cavity that will be mm. uh, helping you filtrate the dust particles in the inhaled air okay and anteriorly the, as we already have studied uh, the vestibule skin lined the hair lined skin part in the anterior part of the nasal cavity that is lined by your squamous epithelium this is continuous outside is the squamous epithelium only that is in continuation only it will go inside and just bit anterior vestibular part of the nose is in continuation is lined by this squamous epithelium where hair and sebaceous glands again pilo sebaceous units will be there and the infection of this is called vestibulitis so most common organism is staphylococcus aureus anti staphylococcal antibiotics needs to be given similar to your furuncle over here in the external auditory canal in the external auditory canal if you see so if you see your ear and this is your external auditory canal here there is outside this hair lined part infection of this part is called as furunculosis this is caused by staph aureus also the same thing okay again the same thing happens here okay right <coughs> So any swelling in the cartilaginous part of the ears is furuncle. Any single swelling in the bony part is osteoma, and small multiple swellings in the bony part of the ears is exostosis. Hope you remember. So coming to the functions of the nose, you know respiration, olfaction, and ventilation of the sinuses. Okay. Say so remember one thing: while you are inhaling the air, the air directly goes into the lungs. Nowhere it is going to uh, deviate. While you are exhaling. the exhaled air will enter into the sinuses all the sinuses are ventilated during expiration not during inspiration important mcq what is kalman syndrome anosmia associated with hypogonadism anosmia means complete absence of smell hypo hyposmia decreased uh, so decreased sensation of smell cacosmia any smell is sensed as bad smell cacosmia most cases post covid cases have complained this cacosmia reasons are known and parosmia one type of smell is being perceived as another type this was also complained by most post covid cases okay right <clears throat> coming to the air conditioning that's what i told temperature and humidity are adjusted according to the body temperature so what exactly is happening here see this is your inferior turbinate the blood flow inside the inferior turbinate is from posterior to anterior right and the air flow while inspiration is from anterior to posterior so why this inverse flow is there is that 
maximum amount of the time within this less span of time for the maximum duration both the air and the blood can can be in contact right so that maximum temperature shift from the blood can occur to the uh, inhaled air okay so that's why the blood flow in the nose is arranged from posterior to anterior okay see during inspiration the air directly goes into the lungs but while during expiration see the uh, eddy currents will be generated and all this uh, expired air will ventilate the sinuses and they will come back okay so you can see if you take a microscopic section of the mucosal layer you can see the cilia on the respiratory type of epithelium what is your respiratory type of epithelium ciliated columnar pseudo stratified you can see the pseudo stratified appearance over here nuclei are arranged at a different level that appears as a stratified but in fact they are not stratified there is a single layer only okay and they are you can see columnar in appearance and you can see the cilia ciliated okay so cilia always be towards inside okay so the cilia will be beating inside and they will be carrying this all the attached dust particles or the uh, harmful bacterial viral fungal spores all these will be attached to this nasal cavity sorry with this watery layer over the nasal lining uh, because the lining uh, and uh, this cilia due to their constant beating from anterior to posterior the watery layer will be slowly carried along with its uh, tra trapped dust and everything will be carried towards the pharynx and then into the esophagus and then into the stomach where in the acid it gets destroyed everything gets destroyed right so that is how it have this mechanism is called as conveyor belt mechanism right like conveyor belt the cilia will be beating like this okay so slowly new mucus will be forming old mucus which gets entrapped with all the dust and bacteria all those things will be going back and will be getting okay, digested inside right so coming to the pathological conditions of the nose acute rhinitis that means most of the acute rhinitis mostly is related to flu viral infections acute inflammation of the nasal cavity mucosa that is simple as acute and rhinitis rhino means nose itis means inflammation so acute inflammation of the nasal cavity mucosa so it could be most of the times it is viral sometimes it can be bacterial because of this cocci streptococci pneumococci okay irritative sometimes due to toxic gases those people who are working in the factories chemical factories will always be complaining of nose block and itching inside the noses and if you see the mucosa will be congested inside the nasal cavity so uh, there the irritative gases will be constantly the gases those toxic gases will be constantly irritating the nasal cavity and uh, those symptoms will be caused due to that so the due to the inflammation the always the discharge will be there rhinorrhea will be there patient will be constantly sneezing and also nasal obstruction due to the edema of the nasal mucosa and uh, chronic simple rhinitis is nothing but this is due to the infection from the surrounding the <coughs> structures so if there is any sinusitis any anatomical structural blocks are there like cocca bullosa or deviated nasal septum which cause hypo decreased ventilation improper ventilation of the sinuses causing all the uh, <coughs> secretions to get stasis over there and formation of the uh, sinusitis okay uh, occurrence of the sinusitis is there from there the infection can uh, spread into the nose and that can cause a chronic simple rhinitis okay and uh, <coughs> the congestion of nasal mucosa will be there you can just give nasal decongestion antihistaminics see rhinitis medicamentosa see this is due to the prolonged use of nasal decongestants like your otrovin oxymetazolin xylometazolin and alpha adrenergic receptors will down regulate here okay never okay and stop so uh, the treatment is to stop immediately and a short course of steroids both topical cells uh, inhalation steroids as well as systemic steroids needs to be given the result ca prognosis is uh, may not be good or may be good it depends okay hypertrophic rhinitis is nothing but inferior turbinate hypertrophic can be seen in many cases that is called as hypertrophic rhinitis okay the mucosa appears like a mulberry like or inferior turbinate okay the submucosal tissue gets fibrosed under the mucosa whatever the turbinate have sinusoids are there so they will get fibrosed so due to that there will be inferior turbinate hypertrophy the tra treatment is turbinoplasty or turbinectomy okay so you have to provide adequate airway to the patient and coming to most important condition that is atrophic rhinitis so you have causes already described in dingra as a code mnemonic hernia so it can be hereditary so very less cases of hereditary type can be seen 
Endocrinal is most commonly seen estrogen deficiency. Placentrex uh, paste inside or injections inside can help the patient a lot. And the racial that is whites and yellows will get this most uh, commonly. Vitamin deficiency that is nutritional deficiency. The infecting organism here is Klebsiella ozeine in most of the cases. Okay, so anti Klebsiella antibiotics, amoxicillin or vancomycin, this can be given. And sometimes autoimmune conditions, mostly middle aged females, 30 to 40 year old females complaining of uh, atrophic rhinitis, you should suspect for any autoimmune condition in them. Okay, the so primary is idiopathic, in the secondary, you can see the leprosy, syphilis, and rhinoscleroma. Okay, see what happens here is there is a normally respiratory ciliated columnar epithelium is there. Okay, that becomes a stratified squamous. So once the squamous epithelium, so once the squamous epithelium forms in place of ciliated epithelium, what happens? There is no conveyor belt mechanism, no cilia, not ciliated epithelium has now come. There is no conveyor belt mechanism, no transport of the all the entrapped dust particles, everything into the uh, clearance, the drainage system is affected. All the particles get accumulated there itself and starts crusting. Okay, so this crusting will be tightly attached to the underlying surface. If you remove it, it will bleed on removal. So that is why you in these atrophic rhinitis cases you see excessive crusting. Whatever air you inhale, it should get cleared. The drainage system should be working effectively. If it doesn't work, it gets accumulated everywhere in the nostal cavity and they will be forming as a crust like okay so crusting can be seen and reduced vascularity so because there is a reduced all the atrophy is there completely so blood vessels blood supply vascularity is reduced the mucosa appears very pale here you can see the mucosa in this picture endoscopic picture you can see a very pale mucosa not shining or not reddish not not exactly pinkish like this okay so everywhere it is very pale in appearance and uh, there will be due to reduce in uh, blood supply atrophy of the nerves will be there so uh, if olfactory nerves are atrophied then anosmia can be there okay so patient is having anosmia and patient is lodging a uh, bacteria in her nose which is producing false smelling discharge okay that false smelling discharge that false smell because of the anosmia patient is unable to sense that false smell but the Patient is unable to sense that false smell, but the other people who are staying behind, besides, they can sense that smell. So, this condition where the patient cannot smell her own abnormal smell, that is called as merciful anosmia. So, merciful anosmia is seen in atrophic rhinitis. Okay. And all the, in this mucosal lining, you will be having the local immune factors. So, those local immune factors are lost. So, immediately all the infections will set in. So, there will be mucopurulent discharge that's why it causes false smell okay so remember in case of atrophic rhinitis the causes mnemonic for this is hernia hereditary endocrinal estrogen deficiency racial whites and yellows nutritional deficiency vitamins a d and uh, your uh, <coughs> there is infections klebsiella ozeine and autoimmune right so these are the causes and secondary causes can be due to leprosy infection, syphilis which damages the bones and the perforations can form and uh, the ciliated columnar epithelium exactly the pathogenesis what exactly is happening here is the ciliated columnar the normal epithelium is changed to stratified squamous no ciliary mechanism no drainage system all the dust particles everything in inhaler gets deposited in the nose itself forming crust tightly attached to the underlying surface if you remove it will bleed and uh, due to the reduced vascularity the blood supply decreases so that the mucosa will be appearing pale in color and the atrophy of the <coughs> nerve will cause anosmia patient won't be able to uh, sense the smell properly and uh, the local defense layer is lost the mucosal layer is lost uh, local defenses are lost uh, what happens uh, the infections can come in klebsiella ozena they will be forming a false smelling discharge uh, the false smelling discharge due to patient is having a uh, atrophy of nerves anosmia the patient cannot sense her own false smelling discharge. The, that's why other people will be, besides her, will be sensing that false smell, but she cannot. That is called as merciful anosmia. Okay. So that's how. <coughs> now coming to the treatment part of the atrophic rhinitis. Medical treatment is to remove crust. So irrigation with car, uh, sodium bicarbonate and sodium biporate and join one part of each to the two parts of sodium chloride. 
in a 280 ml of water it's just you see nowadays uh, these are all theoretical values but nowadays once an atrophic rhinitis case comes we are, <coughs> will be applying first will be going for the 25 percent glucose in glycerin oil paint will be given to the patient and estradiol sprays are available the estrogen hormone will increase the vascularity once the vascularity improves there are chances that again this may come back or you have surgical procedures also placental extract placentalized injections can also be given submucosally which can also a bit uh, improve the patient's condition and uh, potassium iodide can also be given there is a solution prepared uh, called as chemisetin anti ozena solution against this klebsiella line infective if the cause is infective you can go for this chemisetin anti ozena solution which contains chloromycetin not chloramphenicol remember chloromycetin is in uh, uh, given here vitamin d which is supposed to increase the local immunity and also estradiol which is supposed to increase the vascularity so chloromycetin vitamin d2 and estradiol because in atrophic rhinitis the vascularity is lost you have to improve the vascularity so estrogen is well known hormone that can increase the vascularity so give estradiol and also you know you have to improve the local immunity give vitamin d2 and also chloromycetin antibiotic action so with this mixture of these three is called as chemisetin anti ozena solution okay this can also be given placental extract injection submucosally potassium iodide estradiol spray in the spray form also estradiol can be given and uh, mainly to inhibit this organism klebsiella 25 percent glucose in design paint is also helpful okay and when you come to surgical procedures you have to close the nasal cavities for few months okay in Young's procedure the two mucosal flaps are sutured in the midline okay the two mucosal flaps will be taken and they will be closed in modified Young's in order to provide sufficient air cavity nasal cavity three millimeters a short, small gap is left in between the two mucosal folds which are sutured and a lot of slagger operation is there where you can inject the teflon into the lateral wall so results are not known yet because in order to you have there the uh, idea is to narrow the air passage okay and coming to rhinitis sicca it is seen in hot dry climate so uh, give saline props to the patient and uh, so in desert areas you will be seeing these conditions always the nose or in summer in summer times the elderly people will be complaining of this uh, drying of the nose just give some saline drops and keep on wetting them till the climate changes okay rhinitis caseosa okay so this is nothing but a whitish cheesy material caseosa caseous material gets deposited in the nose and just the nasal washes can be given and if there is any inflammation decongestant anti-inflammatory drugs can be given okay and coming to the drug induced rhinitis what are the drugs that are known to cause rhinitis because nowadays many people will come to you with a nose block hypertrophic rhinitis turbinates hypertrophy the things so what happens so routinely used drugs are anti hypertensives methyl dopa reserpine guanethidine so these uh, neostigmine and oral contraceptive pills nowadays many females are coming with the nose block complaint so that is a drug induced possibly you have to take the drug treatment history you have to take from them most of the times you will get this oc pills use nowadays so drug induced rhinitis remember ocp is the one of the most common drug that is being caused that is causing drug induced rhinitis okay and uh, another condition here we have to discuss is gustatory rhinitis okay gustatory rhinitis simple while eating there is a rhinorrhea rhinitis okay this is gustatory while eating okay whenever you take a spicy food intake there will be rhinorrhea rhino discharge will be coming from the nose so that we call it as gustatory rhinitis especially in this red chili whoever is taking there is an element called capsaicin that stimulates the receptors on the palate as a cholinergic response rhinorrhea will start okay the receptors get stimulated cholinergic receptors get activated and uh, starts uh, secretion producing secretions so rhinorrhea will be there so before meals give ipratropium bromide anticholinergic okay ipratropium bromide is a anticholinergic so this diolin nebulization will be there so give that nebulization with the diolin ask the patient to take diolin nebulization before this uh, meals then due to this anticholinergic effect patient won't be having this gastritis rhinitis condition and also ask him to reduce the spicy food intake right coming to allergic rhinitis most commonly diagnosed the condition in the nose half of the nose conditions will be because of allergic rhinitis 
always the patients will come and will be telling you sir i am getting sneezing every day morning when i wake up i usually get repeated sneezings regularly whenever i take medicines this is reducing and once i stop taking medicines again it will recur so this is a typical clinical presentation of an allergic rhinitis patient so what exactly is happening in case of allergic rhinitis is this is exactly an ige mediated immune response of nasal mucosa okay so there is a ige mediated response to airborne allergens okay so this is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction okay here there is a mediators are released due to the allergic reactions okay so whenever <coughs> the ige releases along with that it releases a mediators these are histamines will be released okay once the histamines release histamines are responsible for this rhinorrhea watering sneezing and itching all these symptoms are due to histamines release so you have to give antihistamines to these patients and allergic salute always the patient will be doing like this sir so there will be a transverse nasal crease will be there so that we call it as allergic salute okay and formed due to constant upward rubbing of the nose by the hand Denny Morgan lines and the black lines on the lower eyelid can be seen in some cases. Those called those are called Denny Morgan lines and allergic shiners also. Black discoloration below eyes can be seen. Those are also called allergic shiners. Treatment will be first line treatment will be antihistaminics. Topical steroid sprays can be given. Leukotriene modification or modifiers like Montelukast and mast cell stabilizers can be given. Omalizumab is also tried attempted. But not, it's a very costly treatment. Not every patient is affordable. In investigating the patient, you can see the serum IgE levels will be elevated and absolute eosinophilic count will be elevated in case of allergic rhinitis. And coming to the vasomotor rhinitis, this is nothing but there is a parasympathetic overactivity of the patient. So here also, as there is a parasympathetic autonomic imbalance is there, so there will be excessive rhinorrhea. Complete, the patient will be completely having discharge Okay, rhinorrhea will be there and uh, the treatment here is to reduce the secretions, the nerve responsible here, the supplying all these glands is the median nerve. So, you go for a median neurectomy. Median nerve is formed by greater superficial petrosal nerve and deep petrosal nerve. Okay, greater superficial petrosal nerve is the first branch of facial nerve. Okay, and the deep petrosal nerve, this is formed by the fibers from plexus around the carotid. So, these two will form and join the median nerve. So, if you do the median neurectomy, the secretions will get reduced. The secretions will get reduced. Okay. And uh, that will be, <coughs> the patient will be getting relief from this vasomotor rhinitis. Okay. Coming to the other condition that is uh, rhinoscleroma. We'll just have a small break. Huh? We'll come back. Okay. So, coming to this rhinoscleroma, rhinoscleroma is caused by Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis. Klebsiella, the name itself is there, Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis. It is also called as Frisk bacillus. Okay. Remember, it is also called as Frisk bacillus. 
it is a gram negative organism okay the stages will be there are four stages will be there atrophic stage first stage there will be atrophy which resembles the atrophic granites all the crusting will be there okay and the next stage will be granulomatous stage okay all the there will be entirely in the nose the painless nodules will be forming subdermally in the submucosally painless nodules just like a granulomas all the painless nodules will be forming subnose and the nose will become like a uh, woody nose okay or hebra nose we call it as hebra nose or woody nose in this granulomatous stage and the next stage is cicatricial or fibrosing stage where all the nodules then go into uh, there will be the extensive fibrosis will be occurring and there will be stenosis due to the uh, mucosal uh, thickening uh, all the layer thickening uh, and now we call this as a tapir nose and after this stage the fourth stage <laughs> on histopathological examination you can see here in this condition Mikulix cells and Russell bodies can be seen Mikulix cells and Russell bodies are seen in rhinoscleroma okay so these are what are these Mikulix cells exactly is that macrophages that digested Klebsiella okay our own macrophages that are digesting the Klebsiella are called the Mikulix cells and Russell bodies are eosinophilic inclusions in the plasma cells so now you have to buy heart this and treatment will be streptomycin okay treatment for uh, rhinoscleroma is streptomycin or you can go for tetracyclines also okay or ciprofloxacin and uh, rifampicin so these are the available antibiotics against uh, klebsiella rhinoscleroma okay and coming to the rhinosporidiosis this is most important rhinosporidium seaberry the organism here causing is rhinosporidium seaberry okay <clears throat> this is a protozoan okay protozoan initially people thought it as a fungus but this is a protozoan so three stages of life cycle you know protozoan life cycle trophocytes porangium endospores so it is a strawberry like tumor okay rhinosporidiosis is a strawberry like tumor okay it is a mass seen in the you can see a mass seen in the nasal cavity over here okay the most commonly it is seen in coastal areas okay where there is high humidity okay where there is a high humidity in those areas you can see this rhinosporidiosis uh, and uh, and histopathology examination of this mass you can see endospores bursting out okay you can see endospores bursting see this is a chitinous wall of the fungal the protozoan and all the endospores will be bursting out you can see this endospores on the histopathology and the uh, treatment is surgical excision okay surgical excision is the only treatment and uh, most important is base cauterization so you should and must do the cauterization of the base otherwise it will recur another medical treatment is there dapsone can be given okay but not that much effective it's always better to go for a surgical excision and also post-op medical management with dapsone can be given for few days okay so base cauterization is very important not just a surgical excision will be helpful in case of rhinosporidium seaberry you have to cauterize the base as well okay right coming to the next conditions so syphilis all these are uh, you can see these are all granulomatous conditions okay this you can go through the nose i think okay the tuberculosis you will come across uh, syphilis we already know there is a destruction of the bony wall of the septum okay perforations bony perforations will be occurring in the septum you know see there is a perforation of the septum septal wall has come completely damaged there see the ultrasonation at the filtrum is lost okay and you can see the uh, septal wall completely here you can see the septum wall see the <laughs> septum is completely destroyed over here no turbinate over here in this side you can see there is no turbinate on the right side you can see the turbinate but left side the turbinate is destroyed see and uh, see the teeth over here and uh, in the tuberculosis you know organism is tuber tb apple jelly nodules these are typical uh, for formations in the tuberculosis okay this uh, these are seen in nodular form of the tuberculosis they do not blanch on pressure okay say <coughs> if it is a simple infective or inflammatory origin if you press that nodule it should blanch because of reduced in the blood supply but these are nodules formed due to tb bacilli and they do not blanch they 
do not blanch on pressure remember this point when apple jelly nodules on pressing they do not blanch okay, coming to the vaginal granulomatous excessive crusting just like atrophic rhinitis you can see here in case of vaginal granulomatosis okay the treatment here is again <coughs> you can see the crusting and lateral nasal wall and crusted mucosa everywhere you can see just uh, saddle nose deformity can occur due to the destruction of the bone of the septum okay the bony, bony part of the septum okay and coming to the sarcoidosis see the nodular appearance of the septal mucosa you can see this clearly says this is a sarcoidosis case and there is a malar rash over there okay and coming to the next uh, sarcoidosis you can see uh, another uh, most important point is panda sign so panda sign you can see in sarcoidosis okay panda sign is seen in sarcoidosis this is seen on gallium 67 scan you can see there is a increased uptake of gallium 67 on uh, lacrimal glands and salivary glands okay in uh, in sarcoidosis when you inject the gallium 67 and take a scan so the lacrimal glands see your increased uptake by the lacrimal glands and the uh, this one the salivary glands over there parotid glands you can see so this appearance will be like that of a panda okay so that sign is called as panda sign okay and uh, coming to the next uh, inverted papilloma this can be uh, come as a mcq inverted papilloma is also known as ringard's tumor or snederian papilloma snederian papilloma okay snederian papilloma or transitional cell papilloma okay Ringer's tumor or snederian papilloma or transitional cell papilloma. Simple, the name itself speaks it is an inverted papilloma. Instead of originating on a structure and coming out, what happens is this tumor grows inward. That's why it is called as inverted papilloma. Okay. This has the strength, enough strength uh, to destroy the surrounding bony structures even. So the even it can push the bony sinus wall even laterally. So it can even push the septal wall towards one side. But your polyp is not enough, polyp doesn't have enough strength to push the structures. Whereas your inverted papilloma will be having that much strength uh, to push the bony structures side laterally. Okay. This is most commonly seen in females, males more than females, more than 50 years uh, aged females it is common strain and in the most common site is lateral nasal wall lateral nasal wall is most common site and the treatment of choice is always surgery so remove the tumor and do a medial maxillectomy okay as this always arises from the lateral nasal wall remove the entire lateral nasal wall that is medial wall of the maxilla remove the complete that is medial maxillectomy and complete uh, next topic is foreign bodies in nose any child coming to you and complaining of one-sided foul smelling discharge okay unilateral foul smelling discharge sometimes it may be even blood stained uh, so that is then you have to suspect a foreign body okay if there is any systemic infection or inflammation going on there should be from both sides it should not the infection should, will not select one side right so if there is only from one side you are getting a mucopurulent discharge so suspect the foreign body immediately in that case and a prolonged foreign uh, if the foreign body is staying for a prolonged duration inside the nose calcium and the magnesium salts can deposit over and it will make it uh, appear like a stone it will make it form like a stone that we call it as a rhinolith okay on x-rays you can see a rhinolith okay on x-rays you can see here you can see the radio opaque subject uh, uh, rhinolith can be seen on x-rays okay if it is formed some few months back the rhinolith formation has already happened on x ray these foreign bodies can be seen and coming to nasal meiosis okay so mostly chrysomia flies of the species chrysomia will form okay they lay x in the nasal mucosa all immunocompromised patients are more prone to get this okay and once they hatch they will form the larvae and the, this are these maggots will be lying inside so the chloroform water inside you can put all the you can see all the maggots coming out inside 
or if you don't have chloroform in your setup just put some hydrogen peroxide inside okay and immediately they start coming outside okay you can see uh, that is the treatment for this nasal meiosis so not much important uh, nasal synechia so this is a post surgical uh, complications so uh, so whenever there is a synechia means both sides of the lining of the nasal cavity will get attached uh, blocking the nasal passage so uh, just remove the uh, synechia under just inject a local anesthesia and remove the synechia apply a pad put it for four to five days and remove it that is it will be healed okay so coming to the next paranasal sinuses okay so important again this is very important topic paranasal sinuses so what are exactly these paranasal sinuses now Na paranasal sinuses sinus means that which have only one opening that is all these sinuses will be opening into the nose only with their only opening okay these are lying surrounding the nose so paranasal sinuses okay so are you already know we have already studied there the anterior group of sinuses are frontal anterior ethmoid and maxillary these are the anterior group of sinuses and remaining sinuses that is your posterior ethmoid and sphenoid are posterior group of sinuses right anterior group of sinuses as you all know will drain into your this anterior group of sinuses will drain into middle meatus frontal maxillary and anterior ethmoid and your posterior ethmoid and the sphenoid will drain into your sphenoid, superior meatus right so drainage of maxillary sinus so maxillary antrum maxillary sinus is also called as antrum of hymor okay it is also called as antrum of hymor okay right this is a pyramid shaped sinus maxillary sinus is a pyramid shaped the base is formed by the lateral wall of the nose okay most common site to get affected because if your uncinate is going to get attached towards the lamina papyracea the frontal sinus will even drain into your maxillary sinus so frontal infections will also ultimately infect the maxillary sinuses also one of the most common sinuses to get frequently infected is maxillary sinus okay remember this point of all the sinuses maxillary is the most common sinus that gets infected repeatedly okay and uh, even during the development also maxillary is the first sinus that develops okay coming to the next ethmoid so you can see the drainage pathways also of the maxillary also see the maxillary sinus lying over there and see the ostium of the maxillary sinus you can see the ostium of the maxillary sinus lying posterior superiorly in the maxillary sinus wall you can the drainage pathway is this okay and coming to the uh, ethmoid sinuses all the ethmoid sinuses will drain into your again middle meatus you can see the hiatus semilunaris over here ethmoidal bulla okay the ancient is cut over here to show you the ethmoidal bulla right okay and uh, coming to the uh, ethmoids okay so ethmoids will be present like a like a honeycomb or like a grape like structures grape like bunch or a honeycomb like structure okay this will be lying like a grape like bunch so you already know the largest uh, ethmoid layer cell is bulla ethmoidalis anterior most uh, ethmoid layer cell is your agar nasi and uh, uh, what else left and these are divided into anterior and posterior we already studied earlier the division dividing uh, structure uh, and between the anterior and posterior is your ground lamella or basal lamella that divides the ethmoid layer cells into anterior and posterior this uh, ground lamella is nothing but your uh, second part of the middle turbinate right and also uh, the anterior ethmoidal layer cells are small and more in number posterior ethmoidal layer cells are large and less in number okay right and uh, in children the most common uh, sinus that gets frequently infected is ethmoid remember this point and frontal sinus you know the frontal sinus will be lying like this and at the opening it will be getting narrowed and again from the narrowed like a hourglass shaped opening will be there the narrowed part is the frontal ostium and immediately the entrance part is the frontal infundibulum and the upper part is the frontal sinus frontal infundibulum frontal ostium and once you come down to the tract that opens into the maxillary ostium and the middle meatus the tract is the frontal recess right okay frontal sinusitis those patients who are having frontal sinusitis it is often called as uh, the term is often given uh, regarded as office headache because when the person this headache will be more in the afternoon time okay uh, till uh, from morning to afternoon it increases and from afternoon to evening to this decreases so the 
frontal headache a frontal sinusitis causes office headache in the office hours the headache will be more okay and the sphenoid will be draining into your posterior that is your superior meatus right okay and here you have to remember two points that uh, the pneumatization of the posterior ethmoidal air cells near the sphenoid sinus is onod air cells what are exactly onod air cells is pneumatization of pneumatization of posterior ethmoid air cells okay near the sphenoid sinus these are called onod air cells they lie near to optic nerve so while opening the onod air cell be careful not to damage the optic nerve whereas haller cells are also pneumatization of the posterior ethmoid they lie in the infraorbital wall and when removing the infraorbital wall uh, infraorbital air cell that is haller cell be careful not to injure the infraorbital nerve and vessels okay and another one is haller cell you have studied haller cell uh, sorry not haller cell that is your agar nasay cell that is anteriorly lying that is a pneumatization of the anterior ethmoid air cells and uh, that lies uh, to the anterior most part of the ethmoid cavity right so this is all about uh, uh, your uh, pneumatization uh, patterns and these are the few abnormalities okay as we already studied this is a conca bullosa we know this is a conca bullosa and you can see the middle terminate curved uh, towards the septum side that is paradoxical middle terminate this can due to this paradoxical curvature see the body of the terminate is uh, covering the maxillary uh, drainage area ventilation area so this paradoxical middle terminate can even cause sinusitis see you can see all the sinus infection over here in this area okay and uh, dns deviated nasal septum see here the deviation is towards the left side and you can see all the left sided uh, sinuses are completely filled with the uh, a uh, hyperdense content right okay and the haller cell see the haller cell which is very near lying to the infraorbital cells and see due to the impaired drainage you can see the development of the sinusitis in this sinus only okay here there is no haller cell you can see the free ventilation of the sinus right and ancinate pneumatizes sometimes ancinate process even gets pneumatized sometimes uh, and due to the pneumatization it gets bulged uh, that will impede the ventilation of the maxillary sinus and even that can cause chronic rhinosinusitis okay and coming to the okay next part the polyps okay fungal sinusitis okay let us talk a few words about the fungal sinusitis okay fungal sinusitis the most common uh, causing organism is aspergillus fumigatus okay aspergillus fumigatus whereas in the otomycosis you most commonly see aspergillus niger and candida are most commonly seen here in fungal sinusitis aspergillus fumigatus uh, is seen on histopathology or in fungal culture a 45 degree branching can be seen and a septate hyphae will be present in case of fumigatus right okay so there are some invasive fungal sinusitis and non invasive fungal sinusitis this is non invasive aspergillus will cause non invasive fungal sinusitis this can occur in immunocompetent patients in immunocompromised those with uncontrolled diabetes or uh, those with uh, other any immunocompromised conditions in those you can see invasive fungal sinusitis that is mostly due to mucor black fungus the most famous black fungus recently due to post covid okay due to heavy amounts of steroid usage uh, there is a immunocompromise and that caused lot of the patients to have this black fungus okay on ct scan especially you can see a radio opaque densities can be seen on the ct scan in case of fungal sinusitis in case of bacterial or any common sinusitis you don't see any hyper densities in the sinus uh, uh, randomly arranged uh, randomly uh, spread this uh, hyper densities can be seen small hyper densities can be seen okay and the fungus will be having the uh, property of bony erosion okay the surrounding bony walls will be getting eroded if it is invasive mucor or rhizopus they will strongly erode the bone within no time they are very much invasive they spread into the orbit and from there into the cranium and can cause a serious fatality okay so this is all about the treatment is always immediate removal of the uh, content okay functional endoscopic sinus surgery so what exactly is this functional endoscopic sinus surgery 
the steps in this is first you do an ansinectomy okay once you do ansinectomy you will be able to identify your middle medial ostium do a middle medial antrostomy widen the ostium that is middle medial antrostomy and first open the ethmoidal bulla and then the other anterior ethmoidal air cells anterior ethmoidectomy and then remove the ground lamella that spears the ground lamella inferiorly and you will enter the posterior ethmoidectomy posterior ethmoid cavity and uh, you can identify the sphenoid ostium with the help of uh, uh, this your superior turbinate and uh, you can uh, sphenoid ostium widening you can do okay so this constitute your face surgery not much important at your level so coming to the complications of face this is important what are the complications of face so inadvertently if you uh, unexpectedly if you da damage the lamina papyracea and uh, that can cause orbital abscess okay orbital abscess uh, sometimes okay or orbital cellulitis okay first it can start as orbital cellulitis or orbital abscess can form or orbital hematoma because most commonly anterior ethmoid artery will be running if you injure that anterior ethmoidal artery at the junction of the frontoethmoid suture if you damage the anterior ethmoidal artery exactly from the lacrimal crest 24 millimeters posterior to the lacrimal crest this anterior ethmoidal artery will be lying if you damage it what happens this will immediately get cut and it will be retracted into the orbital cavity and uh, there it starts bleeding continuously due to the complete filling of the orbit there will be ex uh, enormous pressure in the orbit and that pressure will be there will be the optic nerve will get compressed due to the enormous pressure inside the orbit immediately you have to do a orbital decompression so you will be seeing the proptosis of the uh, eyeball okay if you are seeing on table itself while doing surgery you have to do a lamina papyracea you have to remove the lamina papyracea and cut the periosteum so that it will get decompressed or in post operative period if you are uh, seeing this uh, uh, proptosis and you have to do a lateral canthotomy to release the pressure inside otherwise there will be a 90 minutes of time for you for the optic nerve if that is crossed the optic nerve will get damaged and uh, you are, the patient will may lose the vision okay right. so these are the uh, most important complication other complications include pyosil formation mucosil formation not much important right now coming to the types of polyps okay antrochoinal polyp the name itself speaks antrochoinal polyp ac polyp antrochoinal so you have the nasal cavity maxillary sinus okay this is we call is antrum antrum of hymor you know so from here first the polyp will form and this will enter into the through the maxillary ostium this will enter into the nasal cavity and this will extend back beyond going into the nasopharynx as well as it will even come anteriorly lying just at the entrance of the nasal cavity so this is starting from the antrum and going towards the coine so this is called as antrochoinal polyp okay most of the times this is unilateral and infective in origin and it is most commonly seen in adults okay and uh, ethmoidal okay ethmoidal polyposis here okay ethmoidal polyposis is almost most of the time bilateral this is mostly seen in children and most of the time it is seen in allergic cases so remember antrochoinal polyp is unilateral adults and infective in origin ethmoidal sinuses are always bilateral most of the times bilateral okay in children okay most common sinusitis in children is ethmoidal sinusitis and most common cause is allergy not infective okay right clear and one more sign we can see here is dot sign or crescent sign what exactly is dot sign okay this you have to remember this is important at your level dots sign or crescent sign what exactly is this dot sign or crescent sign okay between nasal mass and the posterior pharyngeal wall okay so between nasal wall if you see see this is the uh, antrochoinal polyp okay see this is arising from the antrum and this is extending anteriorly towards the anterior coina as well as towards the posterior coina and see here the nasopharyngeal wall posterior pharyngeal wall of the nasopharynx is not involved you can see a gap in between the a polyp mass of the polyp as well as the posterior nasopharyngeal wall this sign is called as crescent sign or dot sign this is seen in antrochoinal polyp okay 
this is seen in anthroquinal poly whereas this is not seen in angiofibroma cases okay or nasopharyngeal carcinoma this is not seen so if you are not seeing any dot sign or crescent sign suspect any nasopharyngeal tumor in that patient okay right clear so coming to the next term leaf out fractures simple there are three kinds of leaf out fractures okay the first one is simple transverse okay and this pass through the nasal floor see this is the nasal floor and the lower border of the septum this is the lower border of the septum nasal floor and uh, you can see here that both the maxillary sinuses will be lying over here so this passes through the floor of the maxillary sinus and uh, as you go posteriorly at this level you will be having pterygoid plates posteriorly at the lower border of the pterygoid plates that level. so this is the plane where your leaf out type 1 fracture occurs okay it involves the floor of the nose as well as the lower border of the septum and the floor of the maxillary sinuses anteriorly okay this is transverse and the second one is very complicated pyramidal difficult to understand pyramidal passes through the root of the nose see this is the root of the nose first point and next point here immediately lateral to this nasal bones lie the lacrimal bones the fractured bull line will pass through this La lacrimal bones and then you come to the orbital floor this is the orbital floor right okay so this is the orbital floor and then the pterygoid plates so as you already know the lower border is here at the level of the type 1 fracture at the level of the, the upper level of the type 2 the upper level of the pterygoid plates the type 2 fracture will pass okay so this is a bit pyramidal in sh shape okay right and the next tree is Craniofacial disjunction, simple. Cranial bones and facial bones will get separated. That is craniofacial disjunction, right? That means your frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital will be the suture line will be passing in between these bones and the lower line facial bones. Okay, skull base fractures will be there. Okay, that is Lefort's type three. Okay. So another bone is uh, zygomatic fracture is important here. Okay. So another fracture we have to discuss is why is zygomatic fracture most of the cases you will come across zygom zygomatic fracture that is your tripod fracture can be seen over here okay so uh, if you see your nasal cavity like this and you have the orbit over here maxillary sinus over here here your orbit maxillary sinus on either sides right there if the floor of this zygoma this floor is fractured what happens there is a the the contents of the orbit will be looking like this okay this is called as tear drop sign okay tear drop sign is seen in zygomatic fractures or maxillary roof fractures or orbital floor fractures in case of orbital floor fractures you can see this tear drop sign the orbital floor gets fractured the orbital contents will go uh, down into this maxillary sinus that is how what is called as zygomatic fracture and coming to the another condition called as CSF rhinorrhea. You see in trauma cases, CSF rhinorrhea. CSF rhinorrhea is most common cause is RTA, road traffic accidents. Okay. And the benign intracranial hypertension is another cause. Most common site is cribriform plate. Okay. Most common site is, you know, what is the cribriform plate? If you take the nasal cavity, and the separating bone between the brain and the nose. This is cribriform plate. Well, or your olfactory fibers will be like, right? Olfactory bulb, right? Okay. Right. So, this is about your uh, CSF rhinorrhea. A clear watery discharge will be coming out through one side of the nasal cavity post trauma. The patient cannot be able to sniff it back. So, if it is, if the discharge is originating from the nasal cavity it can be sniffed back but this csf is originating from the brain so cerebrum so it cannot be sniffed back so this is a typical presentation post trauma from only one side this will be coming up okay also drop by drop this will be coming up this cannot be sniffed back okay also another sign you can see here is reservoir sign what happens when there is a roof uh, break over the roof, uh, the CSF gets down. Here, sphenoid sinuses will be lying over here in this area posteriorly. 
In this side it says the fluid will be collecting and once the patient sometimes when the patient bends forward this through the ostium, axial sphenoid ostium that discharge will come out and it will fall down okay and when typical presentation will be given by the patient when the bend forward there will be drop by drop nasal discharge will be there because of this reservoir sign the sinuses will act as a reservoir here they will be storing all the discharge and when the patient bends forward the discharge will come towards the ostium and that will be flowing out so that is a uh, <laughs> reservoir sign most commonly sphenoid sinus is involved uh, in case of reservoir sign handkerchief uh, test uh, if you uh, clear it with the handkerchief and see after a certain time that cannot get stiffened the handkerchief because there is no protein in that so handkerchief cannot get stiffened beta 2 transferrin also is present only in csf in laboratory test it can be detected okay and halo sign or target sign or double ring sign can be seen okay so central red spot surrounded by a halo can be seen so that is can be seen or cannot be seen that's a different issue coenal atresia there is a bucko nasal membrane bucko means mouth and nasal means nose in between the nose and mouth embryologically during development there will be a partition membrane that we call it as bucko nasal membrane that bucko mem nasal membrane if still it is persistent even after birth uh, there is no continuation between your nose and the uh, this one and your throat okay so there the posterior coena will be closed uh, if you try to pass a small feeding catheter through the nose it won't go okay so if you do a fiber optic laryn endoscopy in a, a nasal endoscopy you will be able to see uh, that uh, this uh, persistent coenal atresia okay so <clears throat> in the nasal discharge also there will be absence of air bubbles okay so uh, <clears throat> and next coming to the next point okay so i think uh, this is McGowan's nipple. What is being shown here is McGowan's nipple. Okay. This is uh, given in coenal atresia cases. Okay. This is McGowan's nipple. Everything is there in the notes also. You can go through it. McGowan's nipple. This is used temporarily till surgery is done. Till that time, this nipple can be used. Provides airway as well as feeding. Okay. In case of coenal atresia. Coenal atresia is a part of charge syndrome, as a part of charge syndrome. So, whichever patient comes to you with coenal atresia, you have to check for other defects, heart defects, okay, and mental retardation, genitourinary, all those defects you should be able to evaluate, okay. Right. So, with this, we will complete the nose part also. So, nose part is really a bit boring only not much interesting content will be there in the nose most of the biharting part will be there in this okay so ear and larynx were completed in the before class if any still small topics are left we will cover it up in the next coming classes i will let you know if anything is there left so only small oral cavity two to three topics are left you will look it in the we will take it in the next classes okay so this uh, will end the this session okay so uh, I thank you all for your patient hearing, okay? And the notes will be provided by your uh, uh, institute, okay? So I'll be handing over this to them. Go through the notes today or tomorrow, and uh, within these two to three days, go through the notes. You will be able to uh, recollect everything, and it will be easy. Ear is very easy to understand. Once you understand the ear anatomy, it is very easy. Larynx also, once you understand the anatomy, it becomes very easy to remember the uh, conditions and no need to buy heart but in nose part there is a bit to buy heart definitely which is very boring so definitely uh, uh, you have to uh, a bit you have to put a bit efforts when studying the nose and anatomy understanding the, uh, the anatomy three dimensional anatomy of the sinuses and middle meatal complex etc et is very difficult uh, so uh, if you read it the three to four times uh, step by step i imagining as if you are in a three-dimensional space okay you will definitely try come to know or uh, the uh, understand the anatomy of the nose okay so <laughs> with this uh, we take leave for this session hopefully i'll be able to meet you in the next session okay so this 